Professor Michael, Professor Mike Calvert, Professor James Bartley, friend of uh, Southern Islands, uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, friends of Southern Islands, uh, all get one talks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes, I have a cold, so, uh, but you can blame it on the Kiwis. Um, <clears throat> I bring greetings uh, to you from the people and government of Southern Islands, and I'm greatly honored to be back uh, here at ANU. I thank my friend, and longtime friend, James Badley, uh, for convening this August gathering. Um, I have been invited to share some thoughts on Southern Islands' relations with Australia, in particular, the question as to where to from here. And I thank you all for gracing this event with your presence. Uh, before I continue on, let me first pay tribute to and acknowledge the Ngunawal tribe past and present, the custodians of the land on which this gathering is held. And I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you may wonder how Southern Islands got its name. It was named by the first European explorer that came to the islands in 1568, a Spanish by the name of Alvarado de Mendana. I guess this is why we have uh, all the islands named uh, in Spanish names. During his first expedition, he discovered some gold nuggets in one of the ridges. I guess he must have thought this is the second King Solomon's Mines, and named the country Solomon Islands. Unfortunately for Solomon Islands, he may have seen the last gold nugget during his trip. <laughs> All of you would know the country's capital city is, in, is Honiara, located on the island of Guadalcanal, famously known as the island where the tide of the Second World War was turned. Solomon Islands has the second largest land area behind PNG and the third largest population after PNG and Fiji. We speak more than 100 languages and dialects, which also pose the challenges to effective communication and development. You would already know that Solomon Islands is one of Australia's closest neighbors. We are connected geographically through a shared maritime border. Southern Islands and Australia also share cultural, social, educational, economic, and political links and relationships. Southern Islands enjoy cultural and ethnic links with fellow Australian indigenous Melanesian of Torres Straits. We are also connected by blood and Christian faith to the Australian South Sea Islanders who came and worked in the sugar cane plantations in Queensland back in the 1800s. In fact, I had the privilege to uh, have fellowship with uh, uh, some Australian South Sea Islanders up uh, in Bundaberg just uh, a day before yesterday. And um, I paid a visit to the cemetery uh, of some of the early Southern Islander descendants, which uh, uh, Australia is now their home. In this regard, and upon reflection, it makes me proud that Solon Islands ha has had, in fact, contributed in a small way to Australia's development. This contribution continues today through their descendants. <clears throat> Australia is one of Solon Islands' major partners for many decades, starting prior to the country's political independence through to today. The Australian concept mateship, giving people a fair go, is reflected in my country's concept of the one talk spirit, characterized by a common identity, or to a common identity of caring, sharing, and working with each other. Australia's investments in my country over the past decades has been sizable. Uh, in fact, Australia's single largest development is, is the single largest development partner and donor in Solomon Islands. The total quantum of Australia's investment to Solomon Islands, like many Pacific countries, goes 
beyond the bilateral relations. It includes Australia's investment channeled through multilateral arrangements, such as through international financial institutions and through other uh, global uh, mechanisms and arrangements. Australia also supports specific regional mechanisms such as a core f uh, such as core funding and project funding channeled through regional intergovernmental organizations such as the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Australia's investment in Solomon Islands over the years had been substantial and I acknowledge that will that with all sincerity. On its part, my country has made some small but serious investments uh, to grow our relationships with Australia. Here in Canberra, we have constructed a High Commission located at various points throughout the High Commission's uh, totems representing the cultural identities from all nine of our provinces. We accept the hand of friendship extended by our hosts through the offer of the land upon which Solomon Islands High Commission is built. Ladies and gentlemen, my country and people, perhaps more than anyone in the Pacific, understood and appreciates the benefits of regional cooperation. For Solomon Islanders, regional cooperation goes beyond the abstract. For us, regional cooperation is real. We are where we are today because of regional cooperation spearheaded by Australia that saved us from ourselves. I believe Solomon Islands and Australia are much closer today, in part as a result of the Australia-led regional assistance mission to Solomon Islands that was launched in your beautiful country as Operation Help and Friend, and more commonly known during its period in Solomon Islands as RAMSI the Regional Assistant Mission to Solomon Islands. I acknowledge that many of you in this gathering would have been involved in one way or the other with Ramsey, some in more limited roles and, uh, uh, than others, like my good friend Professor James Badley being involved in playing a major role in Ramsey. Ramsey was a regional response to my country's call for help led by Australia and strongly supported by New Zealand and 12 other Pacific Island countries. Ramsey's mission objective was to re-establish the rule of law, stabilize the economy, and strengthen our state institutions. I'm both humbled and proud to say that when Ramsey completed its mission in June last year, all three mission objectives have been achieved. <coughs> Over the 14 years of Ramsey's lifespan, the cost came to some Australian dollars, three billion. Over this period, some 8,000 Australians served in the mission. These Australians and their families are now one talks and friends of Solomon Islands in Australia. This has resulted in another success story, the relationship established through a regional cooperation assistance has now resulted in a strengthened profile of Solomon Islands here in Australia and a stronger bilateral relations between our peoples. I take this opportunity to acknowledge the fact that a number of Ramsey officials made the ultimate sacrifice. They will not be forgotten. As a result of the training provided under Ramsey, Solomon Islands police officers are among the best trained in the Pacific. Solomon Islands is now sharing these skills through our participation in the United Nations uh, mission. As well as that, our police force uh, personnel are also providing training assistance to some of our regional police uh, officers. Acknowledge, uh, acknowledging the assistance provided by the region to Solomon Islands, we awarded the Cross of Solomon Islands to eight Australians who were charged with the responsibility of, make, of being Ramsey coordinators over its 14 years of service, including the convener of this session, Professor James Badley, who was uh, one of our Ramsey coordinators. 
To the people and government of Australia who made Ramsey possible and helped my country back on its feet in what was one of our darkest hours, we owe you a debt of gratitude, not only pro providing much of the resources that supported Ramsey, but for also doing some of the heavy lifting, working in partnership with New Zealand and the rest of the Pacific Island brothers and sister states. I thank you all sincerely on behalf of the people and the government of Solomon Islands. Australia is Solomon Islands' security partner of choice. Solomon Islands and Australia signed the Australia-Solomon Island uh, Security Agreement last year highlighting a new dawn, the two countries' security cooperation. Australia's support to maritime boundary surveillance through the construction and supply of modern patrol boats addresses huge gaps in, in capacity that my country faces. We anticipate receiving two new patrol boats uh, early next year and are in continuing, dis uh, in continuing discussions in relation to other gaps in our security parameters. Solomon Islands is also watching with interest the proposed Australia Pacific Security Colleges with the view to seeking more clarity on what it is, its purpose, and mode of country engagement. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Australia had and continues to make huge investments in Solomon Islands. It provided substantial financing support to many key government sectors and institutions, including huge investments in health and education. Australia also targets its assistance to infrastructure areas that can unlock economic opportunities. For instance, during this visit, I will be witnessing the signing of a land landing agreement for a new submarine cable link between Solomon Islands and Sydney that is jointly funded by the governments of Australia and Solomon Islands. In a few weeks, I hope to be back in Australia to sign the final agreement on the submarine cable project with Australia and Papua New Guinea, who is also benefiting from this cost-sharing arrangement involving the three countries. Australia has also invested in the new Tina Hydro project. When completed, Tina Hydro will provide up to 80% of the power requirements for the national capital Honiara. However, much still needs to be done as Honiara represents less than 20% of the total population. My government is pursuing further opportunities to shift power to uh, power closer to the rural and remote populations using renewable energy to increase the country's power penetration to many provincial and rural households and reduce reliance on fossil fuel. Other areas of interest including tourism, renewable energy, minerals resources, fisheries, the development of small and medium enterprises sector, including cultural industries. Solomon Islands participates in other broader regional cooperation platforms within the wider region aimed at enhancing win-win opportunities for countries involved in these cooperation and collaborations. For example, uh, ex examples of these include the Melanesian Spearhead Group, which comprises of more than 90% of the total population uh, of the region. The parties to the Nauru Agreement, Solomon Islands is one of the eight countries in this group which focuses on matters relating to the management of the tuna resources based on a vessel day scheme that recognizing, recognizes the value of tuna harvested in the country's EEZs. Joint continental shelf claims with the United Nations Continental Commission between Federated States of a state of Micronesia, Papua New Guinea, and Solomon Islands, and PESA Plus, which Solomon Islands has played a leading role in concluding the agreement and is now focusing on its ratification. Regional cooperation benefits countries where joint efforts result in better value and or, or greater efficiency of scale, 
than doing things individually. Somna Islands participates in regional cooperation and collaboration that lead to benefits for the country and people. Pacific Island countries are classified by the United Nations as small islands developing states. <coughs> Forum leaders advocate we are large ocean states that occupy the world's largest ocean. To put this in context, land area of Somna Islands is about 28,000 square kilometers. Our EEZ is about 1.4 million kilometers, uh, square kilometers. Kiribati, on the other hand, has a much smaller land mass, but its EEZ is one of the biggest in the world, stretching as far as Hawaii, United States, covering more than 3.5 million square kilometers. <coughs> Policing our waters from illegal fishing and poaching is and poaching is difficult given the expanse of the ocean. The ongoing Australia Pacific Patrol Boat program is another example of a successful regional cooperation program going as far back as 1984. Somalia Islands Patrol Boat Tulagi gifted by Austra by Australia made global headlines by apprehending a U.S. trawler, the Jeanette Diane. Our friend and partner, the United States, imposed sanctions on Somna Islands tuna exports as a result. The Pacific came together upholding the sovereignty and respect for Pacific Islands 200-mile EEZ. The matter was resolved. Pacific countries later signed a Pacific multilateral fisheries treaty with the United States. Somal Islands will also be developing our own national oceans policy. This, this is important for us as a maritime nation whose economy is ocean-based. <clears throat> the policy will cover the economic, social, and environmental dimension of the ocean. Work on this policy will be undertaken by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and external trade. Australia's support on developing this policy will be most welcomed. Ladies and gentlemen, like all other countries, Somal Islands exist in a rapidly changing world. It relies on the actions of other nations for its long-term survival. Climate change, natural disasters, epidemics have the potential to impact the country's development negatively. Lack of marketable commodity in a number of uh, numbers of size affect the competitiveness of small countries such as Southern Islands. Multilateral, uh, multilateralism is the cornerstone of Southern Islands international engagement. Having a rules-based international system that is open for all, recognizing the special circumstances of SIDS is something we will always support. International laws, international treaties are our first and last line of defense. These are the only instruments open to us to influence bigger powers to do the right thing. Australia's continued support on several crucial issues to some islands at the global level is welcomed. Ladies and gentlemen, I have recounted the historical foundations of our relationships with Australia, as well as sharing some thoughts on some of our current relationship. I now wish to focus the last few minutes looking ahead where to from here. I do not have a crystal ball foretelling me of my country's future. Like many of you, I am both anxious and perhaps excited about some of the prospects for Solomon Islands development ahead of us. However, experience has taught all of us that caution is an excellent friend and mentor, particularly in dealing with matters in the context of a rapidly changing world. Some Islands will anchor our future relations with Australia on five key pillars, namely 
One, increased focus on trade and investment. We wish to pursue trade opportunities to supplement development assistance. In the long term, development, uh, developing better trading arrangements hold the key to our sustainable development opportunities. Secondly, enhance security arrangements. This is a, mutually, a mutual priority of Solomon Islands and Australia. The current arrangements and proposals are currently being discussed, will provide the platform upon which we will jointly agree future security arrangements between our two countries. Thirdly, infrastructure investment in health and education. Infrastructure investment into areas that will unlock economic development and continued focus on the development and sustenance of our human capacity through ongoing support to education and health would be priority. This will be supplemented by support to other sectors of priority to be jointly agreed between our two countries. Eradication of malaria by 2030 and reversing the trend of non-communicable diseases will be two key priorities. These two diseases currently account for eight out of every 10 deaths in my country. Fourthly, enhancing labor mobility through a more strategic partnership agreement. Labor mobility is a key priority for Solomon Islands. We have already received excellent feedback from farms and companies that recruit Solomon Island workers. We wish to put uh, to place a strategic partnership framework between our two countries that addresses unskilled, semi-skilled, and skilled workers arrangements. Fifthly, strengthening the tourism sector. Tourism is a key part of our solution to development. We will pursue opportunities with the Australian government in this sector. I see Solomon Islands' relationship with Australia in the coming decades as one that will go from strength to strength. A relationship that is based on mutual respect and trust and one in which both Australia and, New and Solomon Islands will benefit. The Australian people through their government had supported my country at its time of greatest need and has continued to invest in strategic areas that will help the country unlock some of its own development potentials so that it can start to focus on a journey of sustained development. With regards national security, Solomon Islands defines security broadly from a sustainable development concept, context to cover non-traditional security issues such as food, water, energy, health security and biosecurity, security relating to natural disasters, and climate events, and the more overt security of national jurisdictions. Solomon Islands welcome uh, Australia's commitment to expanding the Pacific labor mobility. Solomon Islands would like to take a more strategic and long-term approach on the labor mobility agenda. I have been discussing the concept of uh, developing a strategic partnership framework for enhancing labor mobility opportunities between Solomon Islands and Australia within an overarching framework of the Australia Pacific Labor Mobility Initiative. Such a framework would involve establishing a database of worker employment opportunities in farms and other employers, particularly in rural Australia. On the Australian side, this will comprise, among other things, a list of all workers needed by all the farms with the prerequisite skills levels. Approximately 18,000 young Solomon Islanders join the labor market every year. Between 7,000 to 8,000 of these are graduates from our rural training centers, nursing schools, the Solomon Islands National University, and they could participate in labor mobility schemes through the seasonal workers program and similar programs for the semi-skilled and skilled workers from Solomon Islands. Tourism has tremendous potential in Solomon Islands. We will explore an expansion strategy for cruise 
tourism with Carnival Australia. It is my intention that within five years, Solomon Islands will be where Vanuatu is today with up to six cruise, cruise tourist ships to various parts of Vanuatu per week while pushing the labor mobility agenda and cruise tourism, we will simultaneously undertake a comprehensive approach to increasing the numbers of visitors to the country under the normal longer stay tourism. We will step up our capacity to strengthen surveillance of our territorial waters. We share common maritime borders with Australia, New Caledonia, PNG, Fiji, and Vanuatu. Having a stronger fully equipped enforcement presence along our borders is a direction we are taking. The submarine cable and the Tina Hydro projects, which I have already spoken about, are set to unlock many social and economic development opportunities in Solomon Islands. Both projects which Australia has invested in are anticipated to be operational within the next couple of years. Solomon Islands will discuss closer cooperation on visa arrangements with Australia. Movement of people between our two countries is increasing. Solomon Islands has visa-free arrangements with some other countries, including with the European Union for visa tourist visas. Having a similar arrangement with Australia and New Zealand can be a game changer for Solomon Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by ending where I began, by reaffirming that Solomon Islands is proud of its relations with Australia. Australia is partner of choice and a very important friend to Solomon Islands. We expect the good relations between the two countries to go from strength to strength in the coming years. I thank you all.